when, he stowed away on a, a ship for Brazil, and he wound up in Brazil. And it doesn't say how long he stayed in Brazil, but then he stowed away on another ship for the U.S. And when he arrived in the U.S., then he applied for asylum. Well, you know, why didn't he apply for asylum in Iran, or maybe more sensibly in Brazil? No, he waited till he got here to the land of milk and honey, and he was granted uh, get granted asylum. So I consider that fraudulent because uh, he wasn't in any danger once, at least once he got into Brazil. But he, he came on to the U.S. Next, please. And this is another example. I'm not going to talk through it. It's just there. If you take a look at the slides afterward, you'll you can read about another case of the same sort. Next, please. So now, assorted refugee absurdities, and, I, and I've got refugee in quotes here because of all of the abuse and the fraud that uh, that happens. So you remember I, I highlighted the one of the categories of criteria or qualifications for being a refugee was to be a member of a particular social group. So these are all, you know, you can go, go online, you can find the links, to, you can find these articles from these links. Um, a category of deaf Mexicans. Well, this is, this is an article about a, a Mexican woman, middle-aged, by now, in the United States. She was born deaf. She had a hard life in Mexico. Her family couldn't, did, didn't deal with her well. She couldn't get schooling and so forth. At some point, she came to the U.S. illegally, and then at some point, later point, applied for asylum, and she got it. Well, you know, it's a lot, lot probably easier life in, in the U.S. than uh, in Mexico under those conditions, but, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of hard luck cases around the world. And, uh, you know, is the U.S. the welfare agency for, for the whole world? Uh, and then the uh, next one, Guatemalan women with abusive husbands. That's another category. We're just talking about domestic abuse. You know, it's not the sort of thing you think about when you think about asylum. You usually think about political asylum. And then another example, Guatemalan, all Guatemalan women, because Guatemala is, an, uh, is a violent society, so they might be murdered. So, well, if they come in here, apply for asylum, and they get it. Um, how about North Koreans coming to the United States as refugees instead of, more sensibly, to South Korea, where they speak the language and they're really of the same ethnic group? Well, in fact, there's even a North Korean that arrived at some point as a refugee in, in Oregon. Uh, I don't know if the person's still here, but uh, that's, that's there in the statistics that I'll show you. Um, there are cases of people getting refugee status uh, in, their, in the old country where they're supposedly in danger, and so they're invited to come to the United States as a refugee. But then they wait around for a more convenient time to come. And then there's also the cases of uh, where refugees are here. You know, they've been granted a refugee status, asylum. <clears throat> and they go back to the old country for vacations. The Bomb Brothers, uh, in Boston's Bomb Brothers, the Sarnaevs, their, their parents, you know, had gotten asylum, form formally here legally. And um, they went back to uh, whatever it was, Chechnya, I think, for... Uh, <laughs> For visits and so forth. So that's why I consider these are these are all absurdities and they're quite common. Next, please. So Roy, people here are probably familiar with Roy Beck, who's the founder and the president of, of Numbers USA, and his prescription for what we should think, his prescription for what we should do regarding the refugee and asylum um, categories is restricted to cases of people who have a well-founded fear of state. That my emphasis is in the red, but he has the, he had the parens in there. State persecution. That uh, that is the original idea of uh, political asylum, um, <clears throat> not these cases of domestic abuse and, and all these other categories. Next, please. Now, um, this is a huge subject, and so I'm I'm just dealing with certain parts of it, and this is one of the parts that should interest I think you as citizens. Uh, refugees in general are heavy users of public benefits. This is a chart put out by uh, Senator Jeff Sessions' uh, uh, subcommittee on immigration and the, and the national interest in the current in the current Congress. Uh, this is specifically welfare usage by refugees from the Middle East, and this is for the cohort of refugees who arrived between 2008 and 2013. And uh, for instance, 10% uh, of them at at but then the data is from like two, 2014, I think. 10% uh, of them were getting were on refugee cash assistance, uh, which is a federal program just for refugees who are here for the in the first eight months they're here. General assistance is in some states uh, or lo localities, uh, um, people who have no resources are given you know small amounts of money by the local or the state government. Public housing that's federal. That's things like Section 8 housing, supplemental security income. 
SSI, that's a lifetime benefit once you get onto it. TANF is Temporary Assistance for, for Needy Families, which is the successor to AFDC. That's what we usually think of when we're talking about welfare. Um, and then there's a, a Medicaid or Refugee Medical Assistance, and then there's food stamps. So, so anyway, you take a look. This is a, the Middle East refugees. 92% of them are getting food stamps, even after some of them have been here, you know, five or eight years. Um, so uh, let's see, 36% uh, 30, on TANF and so forth. And now uh, next, if you're a refugee and you're here and you're getting, uh, say, general assistance, you're getting you're in public housing, you might be getting SSI, uh, you could be, uh, you're probably on Medicaid, getting food stamps, as long as you're not getting TANF and you're not, as long as you're not getting refugee cash assistance, you're considered self-sufficient, amazingly, Bureau bureaucratic definition. So I call that a fun fact. <clears throat> next, please. Well, those were mostly uh, federal uh, talk costs to the federal taxpayer. Most of us are federal taxpayers. But if you have refugees in your community, you may also have your another set of costs as a local or state taxpayer. And this is a classic article. Uh, next, please. Um, a classic article, again, by Roy Beck of Numbers USA. But this is from 1994, before Numbers USA existed. The Ordeal of Immigration in Wausau. And uh, Wausau is Wausau, Wisconsin. Uh, I've never been there, but it's a nice a town in the heartland, uh, in dairy land, America's dairy land, a uh, town of about 40,000 people. And uh, they were inundated with uh, Hmong refugees who were uh, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Um, so by, uh, by the late 1980s, they were um, a big presence in the town. Like 10% of the town's population was refugees, Hmong refugees and their, and their, uh, their kids. They had large families, you know, families of eight or ten, and they were just flooding the schools. So it's, it's a long article. I highly recommend it, not just for its immediate uh, subject, but also for other discussion of the history of immigration in Wausau, as an example, the immigration history of Wausau 100 years earlier. Um, and next, please. And I'm going to just give you this one quote from, from the article, that in the schools, English was becoming a minority spoken language, uh, many native-born parents feared that their children's education was being compromised by the language instruction confusion. Many immigrant parents complained that their children couldn't be assimilated properly in schools where the immigrant population was so high. And that's not just a case of you know, refugees. That's a case across the country. Uh, in places where there are just heavy immigrant populations, uh, there aren't any native kids to assimilate to. You know, they, 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 they only have a bunch of kids speaking Spanish or, you know, some, some other language, so there's no way they're going to assimilate. Um, and now I'm going to give you a few examples of local burdens, um, got a contemporary local burdens. Amarillo, Texas is one. Um, mayor, the mayor of uh, Amarillo in January of this year was quoted in, in this article saying we have 660 refugee kids who don't speak English and the U.S. Department of Education says they have to be at grade level within one year. It's a looter course requirement. They don't even know how to use the bathroom. Next, please. And uh, Amarillo, in the same article, Amarillo's 9-11 um, dispatch service, their police received calls, emergency calls in 42 languages. I don't know, how do you deal with that? I, I have no idea. And, uh, well, why Amarillo, Texas? <clears throat> Next, please. Well, the, the, the probably main driver is that Amarillo is where a lot of meatpacking is concentrated. A quarter of the U.S. beef supply is processed in that area. And uh, Nancy Coons, who is a, at Catholic Charities of the Texas Panhandle, that is a refugee intake uh, agency, among other things, um, she said the goal is refugee self-sufficiency. And, of course, I've already told you what self-sufficiency amounts to. But you know, even if refugees are getting a lot of welfare, they can still have jobs. It's just that the jobs don't pay enough to get them off of welfare. Uh, so anyway, employment opportunity is important. And the, um, the, the meatpacking industry is a plentiful source of low-skilled jobs. So, um, fine. Uh, okay, another uh, example let's see, of, of, of other cities. Uh, next, please. Okay, I'm not going to go into uh, this in any detail, but Lewiston, Maine has just been inundated with Somali refugees. I should say that uh, almost every Somali in the U.S. is either a refugee or the offspring of refugees. There weren't any Somalis coming here as just ordinary legal immigrants. And what did the U.S. have to do with the problems in Somalia? Uh, I don't think anything. Um, anyway, so they've... Uh, so burdened uh, Lewiston, Maine, that even about a decade ago, the, the then mayor of Lewiston, Maine said, 
you know, publicly and said, could you please stop coming? Some of them would come directly to Lewiston, be settled in Lewiston, but others, they're, they're, once you're here as a refugee, you're here legally. You're a legal immigrant. You can go anywhere you want and settle anywhere you want. So they would, in fact, be coming from other parts of the country because they found that the welfare pickings were terrific in Lewiston, Maine, of all places. Um, so, um, so anyway, I'll, I'll just hold, hold on that point. That's fine. Um, the, the mayor said, you know, please stop coming. We can't take anymore. And, of course, he was called a racist for it. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, the case of suicidal Bhutanese refugees. Uh, next, please. Um, the, these are actually people who came from Bhutan. Oh, here again, here's the map uh, up in the Himalayas with, here's Nepal and here's Bhutan with a, a little bit of uh, India in between them. He's up, in, you know, Mount, Mount Everest is somewhere in there, I think. Anyway, so we were talking about people who came from Bhutan, but they were of Nepali lineage. They have been in Bhutan for several generations, but they were of that lineage from Nepal. Well, at this point, they're ejected from Bhutan, ethnic cleansing, I guess, and the, but they wouldn't be accepted by Nepal. So, well, what's the solution? Send them to the United States. Next, please. So, uh, the final...